during our midweek service. If you're anything like me, you're probably at a long day at work. So I want you to stand and do our very best to worship God tonight. Sing out with us as we sing this is the day. to bless the night tonight. Lord, I thank you that we can come tonight, and I thank you that we can just sing with joyful hearts. Lord, not everything is always going ideally in our lives, but we know that whether it's sunshine or rain, that Lord, we can trust you, that you are good, and that your plan for us is good. So help us tonight to just be encouraged as we study the Bible and as we pray together. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the Kids Club tonight. I pray that you would bless our uh, teen group and our adult Bible study. Lord, help all of this to really just bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, kids and teens are dismissed. All right, and the adults, did you, if you didn't get a handout on your way in, just put your hand up and we will get you a handout. It looks like Ken is grabbing the handouts. And you can find John 15 in your Bibles. John 15.
Just hold your hand up and we'll bring that by. Thanks to so many who brought the shoes tonight. I see a good pile of shoes out there. That's a, a good encouragement for the Smiths. We can, I can get them to him. Yeah. So. If, no, no, no. We can. We. I go down to Springfield area, and he can drive up there. We can, if we get enough pile of shoes, we can bring them, and we'll meet up. All right. We're in John 15 again, and we're going to look at the second half of John 15 tonight. Thanks for being with me for all these messages and lessons and really conversations through this upper room discourse and close to Jesus in the upper room. Uh, we're coming toward the end of the conversation that Jesus has with his disciples just before the crucifixion. And so we've learned a lot about Jesus revealing his identity to the apostles. That was one of the, one of the main themes was Jesus revealing himself. He would say, I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So I am the vine. We saw that the last time. And so he wants them to understand that just who he is. But what else? Maybe you can help me tonight. What else was a major theme that we've seen in this discourse, this conversation in the upper room? One is Jesus revealing really his divine nature to them. But, but what else is Jesus accomplishing in this conversation? Yes. He's encouraging them. Absolutely. There's a, there's a strong theme of encouragement here. Ironically, though, there's the, the converse of that as well. He's challenging them as well. Both are there. So, but the theme of encouragement is going to come up again tonight. What else has been a theme in this time in the upper room with the disciples? Okay, sure. What else? Other themes that were here? Anybody? Think back. I know you're like, it's like, oh man, it's middle of my week. I've worked all day. You're just supposed to come and tell me. I know, I know. So it's okay if they're not coming right to your mind. But sometimes if I take another sip of coffee, then somebody else thinks of something. So what's, what was another theme? service yeah that you're it started with the washing of the feet you're going to be my disciples so that's i'd say that's a theme in here servant is not greater than his lord yes yeah that he's the exclusive way he said i am the way he said i am the true vine yeah so the exclusivity of christ that's actually going to set up the discussion tonight that that right there it's going to become a a, a sticky point. Anything else has been a theme in here? It's actually one really big one that we haven't said yet. Okay, that wasn't what I was thinking, but that is 100% correct, that there are false believers. He said that one of you is going to betray me, and then he said there would be branches that are, that are dead branches. Yeah. His return, yeah, his... <laughs> The whole idea that he's leaving, but he is also returning is a theme. The Holy Spirit is a major theme, it's preparing them for the life that they're going to have with the Holy Spirit. Then there's one other that we haven't got yet. It's a big, big one. A new commandment I give you. Love one another. If I have served you, serve one another. Love one another. That's a, that's, that comes up over and over. By this will all men know you're my disciples if you have loved one to another. So these are major themes. And so with that now, we come to really a, maybe the most difficult section. 
And that's in chapter 15 and in verse number 18. Very strong words in John 15, 18 and following. Let's read it together. It says this. It says, if the world, what's the word? Hate. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, the word if is used a lot in this passage. And in the Greek language, the word if is conditional, and there's different classes of conditions. Sometimes it's an if like, hey, this is a possibility. But sometimes the word if is used in the sense sense. Like we would say, well, um, if, if, um, um, if you, if you, all right, all right, let's do this. Um, man, my mind just went blank. Sometimes we, sorry, I'm human. I forget stuff. So I just went blank on this. But sometimes we use the, I can't think of a good illustration, but sometimes we use the word if in a sense sense. In other words, like if this is true and we know that it is true. So it's, sometimes it's used to, to speak to the very hypothetical, like this is possibility, but then it's used in the way that we would say, well, if this is true, and yes, we know that it is true. Yes. Yeah, it's rhetorical for sure. And um, for some reason tonight, my mind is just empty and thinking of the English equivalent, those times where we use if in that way. But this is that idea here. When he tells them, if the world hates you, we know what he's telling them is a reality. It's not a possibility. It's a definite reality. This is going to happen. And when it happens, he says to the disciples, when this happens, I want you to understand some things. If the world hates you, you need to know that it hated me first. Now, verse 19, if ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. One of the uncomfortable realities of the Christian faith throughout the centuries is that Christians have been, and in some places are today, a hated and despised group of people. Now, we, what I don't want to do tonight is I don't want us to... to kind of sulk into a martyr complex. Because in the United States of America, we, uh, it, I'll speak to some of the cultural issues of today, but we, we enjoy a level of freedom of expression and worship and that is unprecedented in all of human history. So we should be careful not to develop this complex where, you know, oh, woe is us, we are the persecuted ones. But at the same time, we do need to understand that there is a built-in animosity against Christianity that has been rooted in the world system. So we also need to define the world. When we say the world, are we speaking of every individual in the world? Well, obviously not. But we are speaking of, as the Bible refers to, the system of the world. And who governs the system of the world? Who governs the system of the world? Satan does. In fact, we, we know this. This is, not a, this is not, a, uh, it's not a questionable part of Christianity. It's an, it's a, it's, the Bible refers to Satan as the God of this world. Satan tempted Jesus, and he took him up and showed him the kingdoms of the world and said, I will give these kingdoms to you. We know from the book of Ephesians that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. We learn that even the very in places of prominent government, 
that the, the, the evil one, Satan, has dominion and authority and power. So we know that there is a world system, and we know that it is, there's a built-in animosity toward Jesus Christ and Christianity. And so we're going to talk tonight about how Jesus prepared his disciples to face the hatred of the world. And less people, so on the one hand, I said we shouldn't, we shouldn't sulk into a martyr complex, but then at the same time, we, we should push back a little bit at those who would say, oh, there is no hatred of Christianity, that just doesn't exist, it's all in, in your imagination. Well, well, wait a minute, Christianity started because our founder, the Lord Jesus Christ, was unjustly put to death. Now, of course, he rose from the dead, but then all of the apostles, save one, face martyrs' deaths. And in most places where Christianity has been, in most cultures, it has faced persecution. In the United States and in Western civilization, we have the unique distinction of being a culture that was founded on a Christian ethic. So we haven't dealt with that as much. However, we're seeing that change. And we do live today in probably the last 10 years have been the most rapid cultural change that have happened in the United States. Our culture began to shift 60 years ago. In the last 10 to 15 years, that pace of change has, has accelerated at an unprecedented rate. I'm going to speak about that in a, in a minute. Now, this is very real for the disciples because in just a few hours, Jesus is going to be put to death. And they're going to witness this before their very eyes. So this hatred is going to be upfront and personal. This is when it, 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 it goes from being, you know, theory or discussion to, oh, right in your face. And that's what they're about to experience. And so Jesus is preparing them for facing the hatred that's going to come up against them and how to respond to it. So let's turn over on our notes, and I want to give you really just two main subjects tonight, and I'll let you contribute. If we have some time, you, you can give me your thoughts and add to the discussion. But I want to look at this in two main themes. Number one, why does the world system, why does the world hate Christianity, Jesus, the followers of Jesus? And then secondly, Jesus points us to hope over hatred, that there is hope even though the disciples of Jesus face hatred. So number one tonight, and you've got some blanks to fill out. Every blank starts with the letter C, so just listen for the C's and you can fill in the, fill in the blanks tonight. But let's see this first of all, what Jesus says, why this happens. Verse, verse number 19, if ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. I summarize this with the first blank there is one of the reasons is loss of control. Loss of control. And do you see why I'm coming to that conclusion from this verse? Like what is the, what is the point here in that Jesus is saying or do you have any thoughts on this statement? If you were of the world, um, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, I've chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. Thoughts on that or this idea of loss of control? Yeah. There's a sense of belonging, right? The sense of belonging, when Jesus says of the world, it's, it's the idea of possession, right? Like you belong to, if you belonged to. Think about the, the what, what is, how would you define the modern view of tolerance? How would you define sec, the secular view of tolerance? Let me give you what, what my favorite definition of tolerance is. And this one, um, Christian author Tim Keller, he's got a good statement on tolerance. And this, this helped me. He said, tolerance is not agreeing with every position that someone holds. True tolerance is re regarding how you treat someone 
with whom you disagree. Now, I find that to be a very helpful statement. Because that's true. The, the message of Christianity is a message of tolerance. It's that we don't, we are not to, now many intolerant things have been done in the name of Christianity, but true, the message of Christ is yes, we tolerate. In fact, we love those whom we disagree with and those who even would hate us. That's what we are supposed to embody. Now, again, I'm speaking of the, the, the Christian ideal doesn't always I know it's not always exhibited, but if you go to the words of Christ and the essence of Christianity, it's, yes, you don't only tolerate, but you love. Yes? Yeah, people don't want to be tolerated. They want to be loved. Yeah. Actually, that's a good point, because we're not, I'm not called to tolerate you. I'm called to love you. And I can't love you. It's not loving. It is not loving to endorse a behavior that is destroying you. So you take some of the biggest dividing issues of our day today, the, take the sexuality and gender issue. That's probably the number one source of hatred for Christianity in the United States today. It's not, you're right, I'm not called, I'm called to a higher ethic than tolerance. Thanks for saying that. Because it's not loving for me to pretend that your lifestyle is for your benefit and for your good. Now, at the same time, it's not for me to dictate or to command you to conform to, to me either, right? I don't have that power. I don't exert that, that authority. But there's a false view. So, the, so I would say the modern view of, of tolerance that's, that's preached and promoted is not about how we treat each other. It's that we must, we must have full agreement with whatever the prevailing philosophy of the day is. But Christianity has been counter to every culture that it's ever encountered. But it's also, it's not, it's not only been counter to every culture, but Christianity has also endorsed components of different cultures. Like when we send missionaries, we can, we send, we'll send missionaries into uh, all kinds of different cultures. And as they encounter those cultures, there are things that other cultures, other behaviors in other cultures that are more in line with biblical values than ours. And so in those areas, th th that's celebrated. But there's always something because the true belonging of the Christian is not to the human expression. It's not to the human, it's not to the government. It's not, to, th this by the way is why you've seen extreme persecution in communist countries in the last hundred years. Because in a communist country, the, the main ideology is you belong to either, whether it's a communist or a um, fascist, they're a little bit different, but the idea is your identity is connected to what? the state or the class or the government. That is who you are. But the Christian says, and in Rome, in Rome, your identity, you belong to, if you were a Roman, who did you belong to? Yeah, you belong to Rome. You belong to Caesar. And you could do anything you wanted so long as your ultimate allegiance was to Caesar or in some totalitarian places to the state. But Christianity has always been a message, no, that we only belong to God. We only belong to him. And so there's, a, there, there's something there that the world has lost control. And so the issues have been different in every culture, but the loss of control has been the same. And that's one of the things Jesus says is because you don't belong to the world and you'll never belong to the world. Any thoughts before I move on to the, to the next one? Okay. Second one. Jesus says this. He says, in verse number 20, Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Now that's important. What he's saying is that there will be people... There would be people, Jesus said this a lot to the Jewish religious leaders of the day. He said, you don't really know the Father. 
they were speaking on behalf of the Father. They felt that they had great confidence in their religion. But Jesus said, the reason they're persecuting you is because they do not have a real relationship with God. And so as Jesus presents himself as the exclusive way to God, that's going to create conflict. Now, let's read on a little bit more. Verse 22. If I had not come and spoken unto them. So the next blank here, why the world hates, first of all, is loss of control. Secondly, is the works and words of Christ. The works and words of Christ. He says, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. This idea of Jesus through both his deeds and his words revealing what? What, is, what did Jesus reveal? Now, the, most people are very comfortable with the idea that Jesus revealed love, and we're so thankful for that. But that's not what he's pointing to right now. By his words and by his deeds, what did he point to? Sin. He pointed to sin. He is the bright light shining in the darkness. Now, we also need to look at this. The sin that Jesus is referring to here is not, it, they, it wasn't even things like, what I'm trying to point out is that there's such a huge range here. Like these people were very moral people. The, hate, the first haters of Jesus were very moral people. They're ethically moral, sexually moral, they're in their family relationships, very more, they're very moral people. But their ultimate sin was self-righteousness and pride. So that's that context. But then Christianity would also go into a pagan culture among the, the Romans and the Greeks. And their issue was different. Their issue was that the apostles would, would speak about their immorality and how they, they, were, they were sexually promiscuous and all of that. So Jesus was an equal opportunity beacon of light and pointer to sin. He revealed the sin that people have. He's the ultimate standard of perfection. And Jesus says this hatred is because I'm revealing true righteousness, both through, both through his words and through his deeds. Somebody's car is going off. I just want to make sure it's not one of ours here. It seems to be... Um, Seth, would you mind checking whose car is going crazy? Appreciate it, sir. I think it's somebody here. Don't everybody beep their things at once, you know, <laughs> set the whole neighborhood off, right? Oh, I think it stopped. Seth fixed it just like that. All I had to do was stand up. Um, so Jesus, through his wor words and through his deeds, he is, there's an inadequacy that people feel. And there's one of two reactions. The, the reaction that delights the heart of God is repentance. That says, oh, Jesus, you would still love me a sinner. But then the other reaction is a refusal to submit and a denial and say, no, my life is right. We need to prepare ourselves. And I'd say in, in a culture that's rapidly changing, and perspectives on Christianity, especially in the Northeast, are rapidly pivoting, we need to, to, we need to be okay with the fact that people will hate what we believe and sometimes hate us. We need to prepare ourselves for that. Now, it sounds like okay in theory, but we also need to understand that our children could face that that this is the culture that we live in. In fact, Deborah and I were talking, and she shared a, a, a very local story. I won't get into too many specifics other than that in one of the small towns in the surrounding community in which we are, 
one of the small towns has a serious debate going on within their school system. And many of the people in the town have Christian values. It's a very small town. Well, one of the teachers in the school, and a student took a picture, brought it home, one of the teachers in the school plastered on the, on the board something to this effect. If you call something, if you call someone's, I'm going to paraphrase this, but if you call someone's lifestyle sin, that is oppression. That was the statement. And so there was a contentious meeting. And someone was told by school people, well, you are, what was the phrase? Jesus what? You Jesus lovers or something like that. And, and basically just completely scorned. And the person said, I am not advocating, I don't want Christianity taught in the school. So they, and for instance, the woman said, I am very pro-life. But I am not, I don't want that promoted in the school either. I just want the school to be a neutral place. But that was not acceptable. So this happens like in real situations that real people are, are facing in, in our world today. I know that Mike has shared some of the issues that you faced in some of your classes. Um, and, you know, Mike is about the, the, the least angry and bigoted person I know, right? There is a, um, there's a danger in, there, there's a, something, ever since I've been in the ministry, I came into the ministry right as all these cultural things started to pick up speed. And among pastors my age, there were a lot of books written and a lot of topics given about how we should address these cultural issues of the day. And statements like, well, we, you know, we must approach people with kindness. We must approach people with compassion and try to win them over. And I think the error that some of us made, you say, well, what could be wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. But listen, I think one of the errors that some of us made was this. Well, if I say it the right way, and if I make a compelling enough argument, and I'm kind enough and compassionate enough about the point, then it will win people over. But the fact is, it doesn't. It doesn't. Now, I should be, I should be kind and compassionate in the way that I speak about those things because that's the model of Christ. That's Christian love. That's the right thing to do. But we had this theory that if we would just be really nice about Christianity to the world and not like those old-fashioned, angry fundamentalists, you know, we're going to be nice about it, then people will see it our way. I'm all for the kindness and the, and the compassionate approach. It's biblical. It's right. That's why we should do it. But we are in a culture where that is... It's not convincing. The, the hatred is still there. It's something that Jesus said. After all, who was more compassionate than Jesus? Yet he was put to death. Yes. Well, I, I think there's a greater danger in a knee-jerk reaction and saying, well, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to go out there and tell people how it is and get in their face because that doesn't exhibit the love of Christ. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a, the, 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 the point is that Jesus and the Apostle Paul, the other apostle says that the message of the cross would be offensive. It's an offensive message. And so what has happened is some of the people that started off with the, the whole, well, we need to be nice about it, because it wasn't working, do you know what the next step they've taken is? They just water down the message completely. And they come back and they redefine what the Bible says. And so you're seeing a whole movement of people defecting from historic biblical teachings because of the cultural reaction to it. Now, there's lots more to it. I'm giving you a very simplified, so you could bring point and counterpoint, and I would welcome that discussion. But, so I'm giving you an oversimplification, but that is, I do believe that I'm seeing that happen before my very eyes. Yes, you had your hand up. Right. The difference between a harshness and preaching is so unfavorable. 
Right. But in the end, whether it's presented gently or whether it's presented with more force, it's always dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not the methodology. Right. Absolutely. Well said. The Right. 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 And and that's where Jesus is gonna end this part of the conversation too, pointing them back to the Holy Spirit. So we need to understand this. If we are gonna be faithful to the gospel in the days ahead we are going to face what many Christians have faced. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we're going to see the level of persecution. It probably would take several generations, I don't know. But there's going to be a social cost to following Christ. There's going to be a social price that people say. Um, Al Mohler has made a good point time and again when, when he, he made, there was a time in America where, especially in the South, where being an evangelical Christian or a member of an evangelical church was, gave you a little bit of extra social standing. If you were part of the big church downtown, then you, know, you uh, associated with people in a certain way, and that gave you some social capital. And he points out that that's changing in America now, where association with Christ actually is a, it removes social capital. And we've dealt with that a little bit longer here in secular, uh, the secular Northeast. But it's a reality that we can be prepared for. Do you think that that's geographical in the country? Well, you're seeing a geographic. Now we're speaking like about, yeah, social trends and whatnot. I don't pretend to know what's going to happen in America, but you do see people moving in different, in, to different places and people moving based on their ideolo ideology. Um, I, I, I have a personal conviction about that as someone who feels called to minister in this part of the country. Like, it doesn't do us any good if all the Christians move to Texas. That's not helping the cause of Christ in New England here, right? We need to, we need to, we need to stand joyfully and positively for Christ here where we are. Um, because I will say, and I'm getting to the end of the message, so... I'm getting ahead of myself, because many people are still coming to Jesus right here around us. I mean, lots of people. And every place where, where Christianity has even been persecuted in, in throughout the world, throughout history, many people still come to Christ. It's just sometimes the, the circumstances are more difficult for the faithful followers of Jesus. And so we have to be prepared for that. And Jesus speaks about it. So, the loss of control, the works and words of Christ. Let me give you this third one, and this is really interesting. Why does the world hate Christ? Well, no real cause. No real cause. Now, that doesn't mean that Christian people in the name of Jesus haven't done things that have brought it upon themselves. Okay? Christians have done wrong things. But in the best case scenarios, even where Christians have behaved exactly in the spirit of Christ, the, the, the hatred is still there. Doesn't excuse wrong things Christians have done. There have been bigoted things Christians have done, wrong things Christians have done. I accept all of that. But even in the best case scenarios where we have been true to Christ, the hatred, Jesus says this. He says it in verse number 25. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that, was that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. What did Jesus do to them? He just... What? Haters going <laughs> to hate. Yeah. But what did Jesus do? He healed people. He healed. He, he taught. He spent time with them. He loved on people. And... How was he even, like, Jesus would heal someone, and they'd say, oh, yeah, that healing, you devil. <laughs> like, no matter what he did, he was hated. There was no real cause. And so we need to understand that because this isn't, and this is another way that we can love our enemies. The hatred is coming from the world system. It is, it is through people 
from Satan. Jesus would say while he's on the cross, Father, what? Forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, does that absolve them of their responsibility? No, but it points to a, a, a serious um, something behind it. There's something behind this. This is not just about people not getting along. This is about a cosmic battle between God and the forces of evil, the devil. And so they hated me without a cause, without a cause. Well, let's finish with, and I'll go a little faster, obviously, because we're about out of time on the second theme here. Jesus says, this is why the world hates, but there is hope in over this. Because he goes to verse number 26, he says, but when the Comforter is come. Remember him? We spoke about him a couple weeks ago with the Holy Spirit. When the Comforter comes, the one who's going to... Do you remember what we said? What do we say that word comforter means? It's paraclete, the Greek word. It means the one who stands where? Beside. It's the one who stands alongside. He's like, you're going, he says, you're going to be hated, but there's going to be someone standing by you. The blank here, the comforter is coming. The comforter is coming. You are not going to be alone in this. There is a strength that is going to be with you. And he is going to come. I'm going to send him from the Father. He's the spirit of truth. He proceeds from the Father. He's going to testify of me, and you're going to testify too. You're going to keep, this is not going to stop you. This is not going to shut you down. This hatred, this opposition that you're going to face. The mission, number two here, the mission continues. The comforter is coming and the mission continues. Boy, if they're going to, if they're going to come against me, if they're going to hate me, if the whole system is against me, I'm just going to, you know, why, I'm not signing up for this. And Jesus says, no, there's going to be a power that drives you forward that presses you on, that encourages you in your next step. You're going to keep witnessing. These guys could never imagine. The, the, they, they could never have imagined the, the force that they would come up against and overcome. Of how, I mean, it's one thing, like, you're going to be an overcomer. Okay. But they could never in their wildest dreams have imagined the force that they would overcome. I mean, they would overcome, obviously, local opposition, but these 11 guys are going to overcome the Roman Empire and launch the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they're going to have the Holy Spirit. And they're not going to let the hatred... Verse, verse 7, 27, and ye also shall bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. Ch chapter 16, verse 1, these things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be what? Offended. Now, offended doesn't mean like, oh, well, how dare you say that against me? I am offended. We've got too much of that going on today for sure. But this means, like the idea of offense is a stumbling block. You're not, this isn't going to stop you. You're not going to be offended because of this. And now the third blank underneath this section, be prepared for conflict. Be prepared for conflict. He says, this isn't going to stop you. Well, what's not going to stop you? Well, look, verse number two, they're going to put you out of the synagogues. That's social pressure. The synagogue was the center of your social life. And I don't mean social life like, oh, who am I going to have dinner with and play golf with or whatever. No, this is like your, your connection to the entire community was through the synagogue. If you're put out of the synagogue, you're on your own. You're an outcast. He says they're going to put you out of the synagogue. And if you, didn't, if you think that's bad, the time is coming that if they kill you, they're think, they think they're doing a good thing. They think they're serving God. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. Now, why is that encouraging? Because Jesus also told them that they would overcome. 
It's not like, oh yeah, we're being persecuted. Jesus said this would happen. Oh, but if he said this would happen, he also said that we would overcome, we would endure till the end. There's hope through this, that we would keep going. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. Wasn't, I didn't need to, you didn't need to know this way back then when you started. But now I'm, I'm going to go. I go my way to him that sent me. None of you ask us whither goest thou, but because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient, it's a good thing for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. This supposes, or this indicates, that it is greater to have who than who. It's greater to have the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit, than to have the human presence of Jesus. The spiritual presence of God in the Holy Spirit is better for us than the physical presence of Jesus. And he says, listen, you're going to face these things. Now, you and I know we face both natural trials, but then we face spiritual attack as well. And sometimes it can feel overwhelming. But Jesus says this, and this is the last this is my last application, my last point on this handout. In the middle of that, just walk with the comforter by your side. Walk with the comforter. He's there. Jesus says, it's a, it's a good thing that I leave, because if I leave, now you can have the Holy Spirit with you. And the, and the disciples would not experience the, 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 they would not experience all that God had for them until they had the presence and the filling of the Holy Spirit with them. And you and I are given that same spirit. Now, we haven't been given all the exact same promises that the disciples were given. We don't have all the same power to perform miracles and, and, and do the things that were the signs of apostleship that Paul spoke about. But we were given the same Holy Spirit. He's the same one who stands beside us. He's the same one who strengthens us. And he's the same one that God has given us to have a cheerful, joy-filled, loving response to even the hottest hatred that could come up against us. So Jesus says, be prepared to face it. But face it with love, face it with joy, and don't let it stop you. Carry on with the work God's given you. I've seen... I've seen multiple reactions. Now, I'll finish with this. I've seen multiple reactions to people facing opposition. One, they just kind of cower away and they just give up. They say, well, I, I just, I didn't sign up for this. Two, I've seen Christians hit back. You know, like, oh, you're going to come up against me? Let me tell you something. And you're going to punch, the world's going to punch, I'm going to punch back hard. And those people typically get hard and bitter and angry, and they don't reach anybody for Christ. But then I've seen other Christians who respond with the joy of the Lord, with a strange but supernatural energy from the Holy Spirit that goes into a world where even facing the, the worst and the ugliest of opposition, says, let me tell you about Jesus and how he's changed my life. Just like the disciples, we've been with him from the beginning. Let me still tell you about him, no matter what. That's how to face the hatred that is intrinsic in this world system against, against Christ. And that's an important theme that Jesus addresses here with the disciples in the upper room. Any last thoughts before I close the book tonight? Yes? Yeah. Turn tables over, spoke with force. Yeah. I would just say, if you're going to take that approach, you'd better make sure you have the same control over the flesh that Jesus had. Yeah. I just... Yeah. I, I agree with that. Uh, but sometimes, if you... The Bible says, speak the truth in love. 
Jesus said, be harmless as doves, wise as serpents. I think you also need to consider how Jesus addressed different groups of people. His harshest words were for the religious leaders. All the people that he called vipers, they were involved in in really using the faith for their own benefit. When you find him with the immoral, quote-unquote, sinners, you find him eating with them, spending time with them. So I agree with you that sometimes we need to be forceful. But the flesh is weak. And sometimes I've seen people react in a very fleshly way and say, well, Jesus turned over tables. And I think that, you know, that's, that's a danger as well. It is interesting, though, that while Jesus called the Pharisees, you know, generation of vipers, etc., when Paul spoke against the high priest, he then apologized for it, the Apostle Paul. Um, You can read that in the book of Acts, that he called the, what did he call him, a whited sepulcher? And uh, and then he said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize he was the high priest, I shouldn't have said that. So, I don't know, it's, you know, I, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So it's a good good rule. Mike and then Teresa. Be prepared for conflict. Teresa. He'll teach you all things. Let every man be slow to speak, slow to wrath. Yeah. That whole idea of slow to wrath, um, that's an important one. You better think. Yeah. Be slow, though, before you're going to do that. So. Okay. Good, good points. Good thoughts. Let's... Uh, Let's wrap it up. Dear Lord, we thank you for the Lord, you've called us to live today. We're not called to live yesterday or 100 years ago. This is the generation where we are to be your faithful servants. So thank you, Lord, for putting us here in this time, in this place. Make us your ambassadors. Give us the wisdom that we need. Help us to walk in the spirit. And Lord, we thank you for your patience with us when we slip up when we fail, Lord, and just uh, teach all of us. I do pray for those who may be facing conflict right now, now, those who are coming up against struggles or or opposition. Lord, give them encouragement and strength. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We are so glad that you've taken the time to join us today. If you've been blessed by the message, or if you have placed your faith in Jesus today, we want to hear from you. Maybe you still have questions about what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Please let us know, and we would love to answer those questions from the Bible. We would also be happy to provide you with the Bible and other free Christian resources to help you grow in your faith. You can email us at info at mountgraylockbaptist.com or send us a message on Facebook. You can also call us at 413-662-2107. We would love to hear from you in our desire is to be a blessing to you in any way that we can. God bless.